most historians have suggested that Sumer was first permanently settled between c. 5500 and 4000 BC by a West Asian people who spoke the Sumerian language pointing to the names of cities, rivers, basic occupations, etc. As evidence, a non-Semitic and non-Indo-European agglutinative language isolate. In contrast to its Semitic neighbors, it was not an inflected language. Others have suggested that the Sumerians were a North African people who migrated from the Green Sahara into the Middle East and were responsible for the spread of farming in the Middle East. However, with evidence strongly suggesting the first farmers originated from the Fertile Crescent, this suggestion is often discarded. Although not specifically discussing Sumerians, Lazarus et al. 2016 have suggested a partial North African origin for some pre-Semitic cultures of the Middle East, particularly Natchfions, after testing the genomes of Natchfian and pre-Pottery Neolithic culture bearers. Alternatively, a recent 2013 genetic analysis of four ancient Mesopotamian skeletal DNA samples suggests an association of the Sumerians with Indus Valley civilization, possibly as a result of ancient Indus-Mesopotamia relations. According to some data, the Sumerians are associated with the Hurrians and Urashans, and the Caucasus is considered their homeland. These prehistoric people before the Sumerians are now called, Proto-Euphratans, or, Obidians, and are theorized to have evolved from the Samara culture of northern Mesopotamia. The Obidians, though never mentioned by the Sumerians themselves, are assumed by modern-day scholars to have been the first civilizing force in Sumer. They drained the marshes for agriculture, developed trade, and established industries, including weaving, leatherwork, metalwork, masonry, and pottery. Some scholars contest the idea of a proto-Euphratan language or one substrate language. They think the Sumerian language may originally have been that of the hunting and fishing peoples who lived in the marshland and the eastern Arabia littoral region and were part of the Arabian bifacial culture. Reliable historical records begin much later, there are none in Sumer of any kind that have been dated before in Mebaragasi, early dynastic I. Juris Zarins believes the Sumerians lived along the coast of eastern Arabia, today's Persian Gulf region, before it was flooded at the end of the Ice Age. Sumerian civilization took form in the Uruk period 4th millennium BC continuing into the Jamedate Nasser and early dynastic periods. During the 3rd millennium BC, a close cultural symbiosis developed between the Sumerians, who spoke a language isolate, and Akkadians, which gave rise to widespread bilingualism. The influence of Sumerian on Akkadian and vice versa is evident in all areas, from lexical borrowing on a massive scale, to syntactic, morphological, and phonological convergence. This has prompted scholars to refer to Sumerian and Akkadian in the 3rd millennium BC as a sprachbund. Some scholars contest the idea of a proto-Euphratan language or one substrate language, they think the Sumerian language may originally have been that of the hunting and fishing peoples who lived in the marshland and the eastern Arabia littoral region and were part of the Arabian bifacial culture. Reliable historical records begin much later, there are none in Sumer of any kind that have been dated before in Mebaragasi, early dynastic I. Juris Zarins believes the Sumerians lived along the coast of eastern Arabia, today's Persian Gulf region, before it was flooded at the end of the Ice Age. Sumerian civilization took form in the Uruk period 4th millennium BC continuing into the Jamedate Nasser and early dynastic periods. During the 3rd millennium BC, a close cultural symbiosis developed between the Sumerians, who spoke a language isolate, and Akkadians, which gave rise to widespread bilingualism. The influence of Sumerian on Akkadian and vice versa is evident in all areas, from lexical borrowing on a massive scale, to syntactic, morphological, and phonological convergence. This has prompted scholars to refer to Sumerian and Akkadian in the 3rd millennium BC as a sprachbund. The Sumerians progressively lost control to Semitic states from the northwest. Sumer was conquered by the Semitic-speaking kings of the Akkadian Empire around 2270 BC, short chronology, with Sumerian continued as a sacred language. Native Sumerian rule re-emerged for about a century in the 3rd dynasty of Ur at approximately 2100-2000 BC, but the Akkadian language also remained in use for some time.
the Sumerian city of Araidu, on the coast of the Persian Gulf, is considered to have been one of the oldest cities, where three separate cultures may have fused, that of peasant obedient farmers, living in mud brick huts and practicing irrigation, that of mobile nomadic Semitic pastoralists living in black tents and following herds of sheep and goats, and that of fisher folk, living in reed huts in the marshlands, who may have been the ancestors of the Sumerians. In the late 4th millennium BC, Sumer was divided into many independent city-states, which were divided by canals and boundary stones. Each was centered on a temple dedicated to the particular patron god or goddess of the city and ruled over by a priestly governor, N.C., or by a king Lugal who was intimately tied to the city's religious rites. Apart from Mari, which lies full 330 kilometers 205 miles northwest of Agade, but which is credited in the king list as having exercised kingship in the early dynastic II period, and Nagar, an outpost, these cities are all in the Euphrates Tigris alluvial plain, south of Baghdad in what are now the Babil, Diala, Wasit, Dahikar, Basra, Al Muthannar, and Al Qadisiyah governorates of Iraq. The Sumerian city states rose to power during the prehistoric Obaid and Arab periods. Sumerian written history reaches back to the 27th century BC and before, but the historical record remains obscure until the early dynastic III period, c. 23rd century BC, when a now deciphered syllabary writing system was developed, which has allowed archaeologists to read contemporary records and inscriptions. The Akkadian Empire was the first state that successfully united larger parts of Mesopotamia in the 23rd century BC. After the Gutian period, the Earth Three Kingdom similarly united parts of northern and southern Mesopotamia. It ended in the face of Amorite incursions at the beginning of the second millennium BC. The Amorite dynasty of Isin persisted until c. 1700 BC, when Mesopotamia was united under Babylonian rule. The Sumerians were eventually absorbed into the Akkadian Assyro Babylonian population. The Ubaid period is marked by a distinctive style of fine quality painted pottery which spread throughout Mesopotamia and the Persian Gulf. The oldest evidence for occupation comes from Tel El, Weli, but, given that environmental conditions in southern Mesopotamia were favorable to human occupation well before the Ubaid period, it is likely that older sites exist but have not yet been found. It appears that this culture was derived from the Samaran culture from northern Mesopotamia. It is not known whether or not these were the actual Sumerians who are identified with the later Arab culture. The story of the passing of the gifts of civilization, Nitu Inanna, goddess of Arak and of love and war, by Enki, god of wisdom and chief god of Araidu, may reflect the transition from Araidu to Arak. The archaeological transition from the Ubaid period to the Arak period is marked by a gradual shift from painted pottery domestically produced on a slow wheel to a great variety of unpainted pottery mass produced by specialists on fast wheels. The Arak period is a continuation and an outgrowth of Ubaid with pottery being the main visible change. By the time of the Arak period c. 410-290 BC calibrated, the volume of trade goods transported along the canals and rivers of southern Mesopotamia facilitated the rise of many large, stratified, temple-centered cities with populations of over 10,000 people, where centralized administrations employed specialized workers. It is fairly certain that it was during the Arab period that Sumerian cities began to make use of slave labor captured from the hill country, and there is ample evidence for captured slaves as workers in the earliest texts. Artifacts, and even colonies of the Saric civilization have been found over a wide area, from the Taurus Mountains in Turkey, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, and as far east as western Iran. The Arab period civilization, exported by Sumerian traders and colonists, like that found at Tel Brak, had an effect on all surrounding peoples, who gradually evolved their own comparable, competing economies and cultures. The cities of Sumer could not maintain remote, long-distance colonies by military force. Sumerian cities during the Arak period were probably theocratic and were most likely headed by a priest-king, N.C., assisted by a council of elders, including both men and women. It is quite possible that the later Sumerian pantheon was modeled upon this political structure. 
there was little evidence of organized warfare or professional soldiers during the Arak period, and towns were generally unwalled. During this period Arak became the most urbanized city in the world, surpassing for the first time 50,000 inhabitants. The ancient Sumerian king list includes the early dynasties of several prominent cities from this period. The first set of names on the list is of kings said to have reigned before a major flood occurred. These early names may be fictional, and include some legendary and mythological figures, such as Alulim and Demizid. The end of the Arak period coincided with the Pira Oscillation, a dry period from c. 3200 to 900 BC that marked the end of a long wetter, warmer climate period from about 9000 to 5000 years ago, called the Holocene Climatic Optimum. The dynastic period begins c. 2900 BC and was associated with a shift from the temple establishment headed by council of elders led by a priestly, n, a male figure when it was a temple for a goddess, or a female figure when headed by a male god. Towards a more secular Lugal, Lu equals man, Gal equals great and includes such legendary patriarchal figures as Dumuzid, Lugalbinda and Gilgamesh, who reigned shortly before the historic record opens c. 2900 BC, when the now deciphered syllabic writing started to develop from the early pictograms. The center of Sumerian culture remained in southern Mesopotamia, even though rulers soon began expanding into neighboring areas, and neighboring Semitic groups adopted much of Sumerian culture for their own. The earliest dynastic king on the Sumerian king list whose name is known from any other legendary source is Etana, 13th king of the first dynasty of Kish. The earliest king authenticated through archaeological evidence is Enmebaragasi of Kish, early dynastic I, whose name is also mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh, leading to the suggestion that Gilgamesh himself might have been a historical king of Arak. As the Epic of Gilgamesh shows, this period was associated with increased war. Cities became walled, and increased in size as undefended villages in southern Mesopotamia disappeared. Both Enmerkar and Gilgamesh are credited with having built the walls of Arak. The dynasty of Lagash c. 2500-2270 BC, though omitted from the king list, is well attested through several important monuments and many archaeological finds. Although short-lived, one of the first empire known to history was that of Innatum of Lagash, who annexed practically all of Sumer, including Kish, Arak, Ur, and Larsa, and reduced to tribute the city-state of Amar, arch-rival of Lagash. In addition, his realm extended to parts of Elam and along the Persian Gulf. He seems to have used terror as a matter of policy. Innatum's stull of the vultures depicts vultures pecking at the severed heads and other body parts of his enemies. His empire collapsed shortly after his death. Later, Lugal Zajsi, the priest king of Amar, overthrew the primacy of the Lagash dynasty in the area, then conquered Arak, making it his capital, and claimed an empire extending from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. He was the last ethnically Sumerian king before Sagan of Akkad. The Akkadian Empire dates to c. 2234-2154 BC, Middle Chronology. The Eastern Semitic Akkadian language is first attested in proper names of the kings of Kish c. 2800 BC, preserved in later king lists. There are texts written entirely in Old Akkadian dating from c. 2500 BC. Use of Old Akkadian was at its peak during the rule of Sagan the Great c. 2334-2279 BC, but even then most administrative tablets continued to be written in Sumerian, the language used by the scribes. Gelb and Westenholz differentiate three stages of Old Akkadian, that of the pre-Sargonic era, that of the Akkadian Empire, and that of the Ur III period that followed it. Akkadian and Sumerian coexisted as vernacular languages for about 1000 years, but by around 1800 BC, Sumerian was becoming more of a literary language familiar mainly only to scholars and scribes. Thokil Jacobson has argued that there is little break in historical continuity between the pre- and post-Sagan periods, and that too much emphasis has been placed on the perception of a Semitic vs. Sumerian conflict. However, it is certain that Akkadian was also briefly imposed on neighboring parts of Elam that were previously conquered by Sagan.
Following the downfall of the Akkadian Empire at the hands of Gutians, another native Sumerian ruler, Gudair of Lagash, rose to local prominence and continued the practices of the Sargonid king's claims to divinity. The previous Lagash dynasty, Gudea and his descendants also promoted artistic development and left a large number of archaeological artifacts. Later, the third dynasty of Ur under Urnam Mu and Shulgit c. 2112-2004 BC, middle chronology whose power extended as far as southern Assyria, has been erroneously called a Sumerian Renaissance in the past. Already, however, the region was becoming more Semitic than Sumerian, with the resurgence of the Akkadian-speaking Semites in Assyria and elsewhere, and the influx of waves of Semitic Matu Amorites who were to found several competing local powers in the south, including Isin, Lursa, Ishnana and later, Babylonia. The last of these eventually came to briefly dominate the south of Mesopotamia as the Babylonian Empire, just as the old Assyrian Empire had already done in the north from the late 21st century BC. The Sumerian language continued as a sacerdotal language taught in schools in Babylonia and Assyria, much as Latin was used in the medieval period, for as long as cuneiform was used. Fall and transmission this period is generally taken to coincide with a major shift in population from southern Mesopotamia toward the north. Ecologically, the agricultural productivity of the Sumerian lands was being compromised as a result of rising salinity. Soil salinity in this region had been long recognized as a major problem. Poorly drained irrigated soils, in an arid climate with high levels of evaporation, led to the buildup of dissolved salts in the soil, eventually reducing agricultural yields severely. During the Akkadian and Earth three phases, there was a shift from the cultivation of wheat to the more salt-tolerant barley, but this was insufficient, and during the period from 2100 BC to 1700 BC, it is estimated that the population in this area declined by nearly three-fifths. This greatly upset the balance of power within the region, weakening the areas where Sumerian was spoken, and comparatively strengthening those where Akkadian was the major language. Henceforth, Sumerian would remain only a literary and liturgical language, similar to the position occupied by Latin in medieval Europe. Following an Elamite invasion and sack of Ur during the rule of Ibbi Sint c. 2028-2004 BC, citation needed, Sumer came under Amorite rule taken to introduce the Middle Bronze Age. The independent Amorite states of the 20th to 18th centuries are summarized as the dynasty of Isin, in the Sumerian king list, ending with the rise of Babylonia under Hammurabi c. 1800 BC. Later rulers who dominated Assyria and Babylonia occasionally assumed the old Sargonic title, King of Sumer and Akkad, such as Tukulti Ninurtai of Assyria after c. 1225 BC. Barak, one of Sumer's largest cities, has been estimated to have had a population of 50,000-80,000 at its height, Given the other cities in Sumer, and the large agricultural population, a rough estimate for Sumer's population might be 0.8 million to 1.5 million. The world population at this time has been estimated at about 27 million. The Sumerians spoke a language isolate, but a number of linguists have claimed to be able to detect a substrate language of unknown classification beneath Sumerian because names of some of Sumer's major cities are not Sumerian, revealing influences of earlier inhabitants. However, the archaeological record shows clear and interrupted cultural continuity from the time of the early Ubaid period 530-470 BCC 14 settlements in southern Mesopotamia. The Sumerian people who settled here farmed the lands in this region that were made fertile by silt deposited by the Tigris and the Euphrates. Some archaeologists have speculated that the original speakers of ancient Sumerian may have been farmers, who moved down from the north of Mesopotamia after perfecting irrigation agriculture there. The Ubaid period pottery of southern Mesopotamia has been connected via Choga Mami transitional ware to the pottery of the Samara period culture C. 5700490 BCC 14 in the north who were the first to practice a primitive form of irrigation agriculture along the Middle Tigris River and its tributaries. The connection is most clearly seen at Tel El, Willy near Lursa, excavated by the French in the 1980s, 
where eight levels yielded pre-obite pottery resembling Samaran ware. According to this theory, farming peoples spread down into southern Mesopotamia because they had developed a temple-centered social organization for mobilizing labor and technology for water control, enabling them to survive and prosper in a difficult environment. Others have suggested a continuity of Sumerians, from the indigenous hunter-fisher folk traditions, associated with the bifacial assemblages found on the Arabian littoral. Juris Zarins believes the Sumerians may have been the people living in the Persian Gulf region before it flooded at the end of the last ice age. The Tigris-Euphrates plain lacked minerals and trees. Sumerian structures were made of plano-convex mudbrick, not fixed with mortar or cement. Mudbrick buildings eventually deteriorate, so they were periodically destroyed, leveled, and rebuilt on the same spot. This constant rebuilding gradually raised the level of cities, which thus came to be elevated above the surrounding plain. The resultant hills, known as tells, are found throughout the ancient Near East. According to Archibald Sace, the primitive pictograms of the early Sumerian Ayyarak era suggest that, stone was scarce, but was already cut into blocks and seals. Brick was the ordinary building material, and with its cities, forts, temples and houses were constructed. The city was provided with towers and stood on an artificial platform, the house also had a tower-like appearance. It was provided with a door which turned on a hinge, and could be opened with a sort of key, the city gate was on a larger scale, and seems to have been double. The foundation stones, or rather bricks, of a house were consecrated by certain objects that were deposited under them. The most impressive and famous of Sumerian buildings are the ziggurts, large layered platforms that supported temples. Sumerian cylinder seals also depict houses built from reeds not unlike those built by the mass Arabs of southern Iraq until as recently as 400 CE. The Sumerians also developed the arch, which enabled them to develop a strong type of dome. They built this by constructing and linking several arches. Sumerian temples and palaces made use of more advanced materials and techniques, such as buttresses, recesses, half-columns, and clay nails. Evidence of wheeled vehicles appeared in the mid-4th millennium BC, near simultaneously in Mesopotamia, the northern Caucasus Mycop culture, and Central Europe. The wheel initially took the form of the potter's wheel. The new concept led to wheeled vehicles and mill wheels. The Sumerians' cuneiform script is the oldest or second oldest after the Egyptian hieroglyphs, which has been deciphered. The status of even older inscriptions such as the Jew symbols and Tataria tablets is controversial. The Sumerians were among the first astronomers, mapping the stars into sets of constellations, many of which survived in the zodiac and were also recognized by the ancient Greeks. They were also aware of the five planets that are easily visible to the naked eye. They invented and developed arithmetic by using several different number systems including a mixed radix system with an alternating base 10 and base 6. This sexagesimal system became the standard number system in Sumer and Babylonia. They may have invented military formations and introduced the basic divisions between infantry, cavalry, and archers. They developed the first known codified legal and administrative systems, complete with courts, jails, and government records. The first true city-states arose in Sumer, roughly contemporaneously with similar entities in what are now Syria and Lebanon. Several centuries after the invention of cuneiform, the use of writing expanded beyond debt payment certificates and inventory lists to be applied for the first time, about 2600 BC, to messages and mail delivery, history, legend, mathematics, astronomical records, and other pursuits. Conjointly with the spread of writing, the first formal schools were established, usually under the auspices of a city-state's primary temple. The almost constant was among the Sumerian city-states for 2000 years helped to develop the military technology and techniques of Sumer to a high level. The first war recorded in any detail was between Lagash and Amar in c. 2450 BC on a stull called the Stull of the Vultures. It shows the king of Lagash leading a Sumerian army consisting mostly of infantry. The infantry carried spears, wore copper helmets, and carried rectangular shields. The spearmen are shown arranged in what resembles the phalanx formation, 
which requires training and discipline, this implies that the Sumerians may have made use of professional soldiers. The Sumerian military used carts harnessed to onagers. These early chariots functioned less effectively in combat than did later designs, and some have suggested that these chariots served primarily as transports, though the crew carried battle axes and lances. The Sumerian chariot comprised a four- or two-wheeled device manned by a crew of two and harnessed to four onagers. The cart was composed of a woven basket and the wheels had a solid three-piece design. Sumerian cities were surrounded by defensive walls. The Sumerians engaged in siege warfare between their cities, but the midbrick walls were able to deter some foes. Technology examples of Sumerian technology include the wheel, cuneiform script, arithmetic and geometry, irrigation systems, Sumerian boats, lunicellar calendar, bronze, leather, saws, chisels, hammers, braces, bits, nails, pins, rings, hose, axes, knives, lance points, arrowheads, swords, glue, daggers, water skins, bags, harnesses, armor, quivers, war chariots, scabbards, boots, sandals, harpoons and beer. The Sumerians had three main types of boats, clinker-built sailboats stitched together with hair, featuring bitumen waterproofing skin boats constructed from animal skins and reeds wooden oared ships, sometimes pulled upstream by people and animals walking along the nearby banks. Money and credit large institutions kept their accounts in barley and silver, often with a fixed rate between them. The obligations, loans and prices in general were usually denominated in one of them. Many transactions involved debt, for example goods consigned to merchants by temple and beer advanced by ale women. Commercial credit and agricultural consumer loans were the main types of loans. The trade credit was usually extended by temples in order to finance trade expeditions and was nominated in silver. The interest rate was set at 1 60th a month 1 shekel per mina, sometime before 2000 BC and it remained at that level for about 2000 years. Rural loans commonly arose as a result of unpaid obligations due to an institution, such as a temple, in this case the arrears were considered to be lent to the debtor. They were denominated in barley or other crops and the interest rate was typically much higher than for commercial loans and could amount to one-third to one-half of the loan principal. Periodically, rulers signed, clean slate, decrees that cancelled all the rural, but not commercial, debt and allowed bond servants to return to their homes. Customarily, rulers did it at the beginning of the first full year of their reign, but they could also be proclaimed at times of military conflict or crop failure. The first known ones were made by Enmetena and Urukagina of Lagash in 2400-2350 BC. According to Hudson, the purpose of these decrees was to prevent deaths mounting to a degree that they threatened the fighting force, which could happen if peasants lost their subsistence land or became bond servants due to inability to repay their debt. Evidence for imports from the Indus to Ur can be found from around 2350 BC. Various objects made with shell species that are characteristic of the Indus coast, particularly Trubanella pyrum and Fasciolaria trapezium, have been found in the archaeological sites of Mesopotamia dating from around 2500-2000 BC. Carnelian beads from the Indus were found in the Sumerian tombs of Ur, the royal cemetery at Ur, dating to 2600-2450. In particular, Carnelian beads with an etched design in white were probably imported from the Indus Valley, and made according to a technique of acid etching developed by the Harappans. Lapis lazuli was imported in great quantity by Egypt, and already used in many tombs of the Nakada the second period c. 3200 BC. Lapis lazuli probably originated in northern Afghanistan, as no other sources are known, and had to be transported across the Iranian plateau to Mesopotamia, and then Egypt. Several Indus seals with Harappan script have also been found in Mesopotamia, particularly in Ur, Babylon and Kish. Gudea, the ruler of the neo sumerian Empire at Lagash, is recorded as having imported translucent carnelian from Melucha, generally thought to be the Indus Valley area. Various inscriptions also mention the presence of Melucha traders and interpreters in Mesopotamia. About 20 seals have been found from the Akkadian and Earth-3 sites, 
that have connections with Harappa and often use Harappan symbols or writing. The Indus Valley civilization only flourished in its most developed form between 2400 and 1800 BC, but at the time of these exchanges, it was a much larger entity than the Mesopotamian civilization, covering an area of 1.2 million square meters with thousands of settlements, compared to an area of only about 65.000 square meters for the occupied area of Mesopotamia, while the largest cities were comparable in size at about 30-40,000 inhabitants. The Sumerians developed a complex system of metrology c. 4000 BC. This advanced metrology resulted in the creation of arithmetic, geometry, and algebra. From c. 2600 BC onwards, the Sumerians wrote multiplication tables on clay tablets and dealt with geometrical exercises and division problems. The earliest traces of the Babylonian numerals also date back to this period. The period c. 2700-2300 BC saw the first appearance of the Abacus, and a table of successive columns which delimited the successive orders of magnitude of their sexagesimal number system. The Sumerians were the first to use a place-value numeral system. There is also anecdotal evidence the Sumerians may have used a type of slide rule in astronomical calculations. They were the first to find the area of a triangle in the volume of a cube. Discoveries of obsidian from faraway locations in Anatolia and lapis lazuli from production in northeastern Afghanistan, beads from Dilmunt modern Bahrain, and several seals inscribed with the Indus Valley script suggest a remarkably wide-ranging network of ancient trade centered on the Persian Gulf. For example, imports to Ur came from many parts of the world. In particular, the metals of all types had to be imported. The Epic of Gilgamesh refers to trade with far lands for goods, such as wood, that was scarce in Mesopotamia. In particular, cedar from Lebanon was prized. The finding of resin in the tomb of Queen Puebiata indicates it was traded from as far away as Mozambique. The Sumerians used slaves, although they were not a major part of the economy. Slave women worked as weavers, pressers, millers, and potters. Sumerian potters decorated pots with cedar oil paints. The potters used a bow drill to produce the fire needed for baking the pottery. Sumerian masons and jewelers knew and made use of alabaster, calcite, ivory, iron, gold, silver, carnelian, and lapis lazuli. The Sumerians were one of the first known beer-drinking societies. Cereals were plentiful and were the key ingredient in their early brew. They brewed multiple kinds of beer consisting of wheat, barley, and mixed grain beers. Beer brewing was very important to the Sumerians. It was referenced in the Epic of Gilgamesh when Enkidu was introduced to the food and beer of Gilgamesh's people, drink the beer, as is the custom of the land. He drank the beer seven jugs, and became expansive and sang with joy. The Sumerians practiced similar irrigation techniques as those used in Egypt. American anthropologist Robert McCormack Adams says that irrigation development was associated with urbanization, and that 89% of the population lived in the cities. They grew barley, chickpeas, lentils, wheat, dates, onions, garlic, lettuce, leeks and mustard. Sumerians caught many fish and hunted fowl and gazelle. Sumerian agriculture depended heavily on irrigation. The irrigation was accomplished by the use of shaduf, canals, channels, dikes, weirs, and reservoirs. The frequent violent floods of the Tigris, and less so, of the Euphrates, meant that canals required frequent repair and continual removal of silt, and survey markers and boundary stones needed to be continually replaced. The government required individuals to work on the canals in a corvi, although the rich were able to exempt themselves. As is known from the Sumerian Farmer's Almanac, after the flood season and after the spring equinox and the Akitu on New Year festival, using the canals, farmers would flood their fields and then drain the water. Next they made oxen stomp the ground and kill weeds. They then dragged the fields with pickaxes. After drying, they ploughed, harrowed, and raked the ground three times, and pulverized it with a mattock, before planting seed. Unfortunately, the high evaporation rate resulted in a gradual increase in the salinity of the fields. By the Earth 3 period, 
farmers had switched from wheat to the more salt-tolerant barley as their principal crop. Sumerians harvested during the spring in three-person teams consisting of a reaper, a binder, and a sheaf handler, 88. The farmers would use threshing wagons, driven by oxen, to separate the cereal heads from the stalks and then use threshing sleds to disengage the grain. They then winnowed the grain chaff mixture. Sumerian science Sumerians had a system of medicine that was based in magic and herbalism, but they were also familiar with processes of removing chemical parts from natural substances. They are considered to have had an advanced knowledge of anatomy, and surgical instruments have been found in archaeological sites. One of the Sumerians' greatest advances was in the area of hydraulic engineering. Early in their history they created a system of ditches to control flooding, and were also the inventors of irrigation, harnessing the power of the Tigris and Euphrates for farming. Canals were consistently maintained from dynasty to dynasty. Their skill at engineering and architecture both point to the sophistication of their understanding of math. The structure of modern timekeeping, with 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour, is attributed to the Sumerians. Sumerian culture schools were common in Sumerian culture, marking the world's first mass effort to pass along knowledge in order to keep a society running and building on itself. Sumerians left behind scores of written records, but they are more renowned for their epic poetry, which influenced later works in Greece and Rome and sections of the Bible, most notably the story of the Great Flood, the Garden of Eden, and the Tower of Babel. The Sumerians were musically inclined and a Sumerian hymn, Hurrian Hymn No. 6, is considered the world's oldest musically notated song. Gilgamesh the very first ruling body of Sumer that has historical verification as the first dynasty of Kish. The earliest ruler mentioned is Etna of Kish, who, in a document from the time, is credited as having stabilized all the lands. One thousand years later, Etna would be memorialized in a poem that told of his adventures in heaven. The most famous of the early Sumerian rulers is Gilgamesh, king of Arak, who took control around 2700 BC and is still remembered for his fictional adventures in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the first epic poem in history and inspiration for later Roman and Greek myths and biblical stories. A devastating flood in the region was used as a pivotal point in the epic poem and later reused in the Old Testament story of Noah. Sumerian power struggles somewhere around 2600 BC, a power struggle erupted between the leaders of Kish, Arek and Ur, which set off a musical chairs scenario of rulers for the region for the next 400 years. The first conflict resulted in the kingdom of Avon seizing control and shifting the ruling body outside of Sumer until the kingship was returned to the Kish. The Kish kept control briefly until the rise of Arak king Ensha Kushanna, whose brief dynasty was followed by Adabian conqueror Lugalan Nimundu, who held power for 90 years and is said to have expanded his kingdom up to the Mediterranean. Lugalan Nimundu also conquered the Gutian people, who lived in the eastern Iraqi mountains and who would later come to rule Sumer. Sagan ruled for 50 years, and after his death, his son Rimush faced widespread rebellion and was killed. Rimush's brother Manishtushu met the same fate. Sagan's grandson, Naramsin, took the throne in 2292 BC. Naramsin considered himself divine and was leveled with charges of sacrilege. The Gutians invaded in 2193 BC following the reign of the last Akkadian king, Naramsin's son Sharkalashiri. Their era is marked by decentralized chaos and neglect. It was during Gutian reign that the grand city of Agade decayed into wreckage and disappeared from history. Anamu the final gasp of Sumer leadership came in 2100 BC when Utuhegal, king of Ur, overthrew the Gutians. Utuhegal's reign was brief, with Anamu, the former governor of Ur, taking the throne, starting a dynasty that would rule for about a century. Anamu was known as a builder. Figurines from the time depict him carrying building materials. During his reign, he started massive projects to build walls around his capital city, to create more irrigation canals, construct new temples and rebuild old ones. Anamu also did the considerable work of constructing an organized and complicated legal code that is considered the first in history. Its purpose was to ensure that everyone in the kingdom, no matter what city they lived in, 
received the same justice and punishments, rather than rely on the whims of individual governors. Ernamu also created an organized school system for state administrators. Called the Edubba, it kept an archive of clay tablets for learning. Thank you. Hope you'd find the content informative. Kindly share the video and subscribe to the channel. Do comment to let us know what are the other subjects you'd like us to cover.